This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. The last couple of weeks, we took advantage of the opportunity to, to look at the, the suffering service and uh, the, su the suffering servant and all that that means, or at least uh, the important points for us to keep in mind with regard to Jesus' suffering on the cross. We go back to, to that scene this morning to take a look at, at the Gospel of Mark again, which we've been studying now for a number of months. I do appreciate your uh, very positive input about uh, this series. I've enjoyed it very much, and uh, I, I really regret that we're coming to an end in the not too distant future of this study because it's been very rewarding for me personally and I, I know it has been for you. But as you know, as you've read ahead, the crucifixion of Christ in Mark is slightly different from the accounts in the other gospel writers. He omits a lot of things that they include. In fact, the actual description of, of the entire event can be reduced down to five verses, and we'll look at those in just a minute. In fact, let's read them together, and we can see the scene as Mark portrays it. Mark 15, verse 22, following. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated a place of place of a skull. <clears throat> they tried to give him myrrh, wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, and dividing up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. In verse 34, the scripture says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 37, it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Now that's all that we have then. The other accounts fill in some details, and we'll look at some of those. Let me take you back to verse 22. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. There's a picture of that place as it exists today that I took when I was in Israel. It looks the same today as it did nearly 2,000 years ago. From verse 37 on in Mark's gospel, the the story surrounding the cross is not on Jesus, but interestingly, Mark presents to us the individuals or groups of individuals who were gathered around the cross watching the crucifixion. And what's so fascinating about this is that he, each individual has their own perspective of what is happening, and each one acts upon the, the crucifixion in his own way. And I believe that if the crucifixion of Jesus were to occur today, that we would have the same kind of individuals observing this crucifixion. And what they did way back then is, is a timeless illustration of attitude, uh, of reactions as as people possess them today. And the first one we, we have in, in this picture is Simon, the one who carried his cross. Mark 15, verse 21. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Simon's our first character, and I know we've, uh, several weeks ago, we, we talked in some detail about him. But let me remind you that he's, uh, Jesus is going from, from the Praetorium to Golgotha. And as he's going, after having 
been scourged, that wicked, torturous treatment of Jesus, which zapped his strength, he stumbles under the weight of the cross. And the Roman officials grabbed a stranger in the crowd. They looked around, and, and here's Simon. He obviously would have been someone who looked strong enough to, to bear this burden. This must have been a grim day for Simon. Palestine was an occupied city, as you know, by the Romans. And the Romans could uh, stop any citizen of Israel at any time for any reason and call him into service. And so here they are, uh, Jesus stumbling under the cross. The one thing the Romans did not like to do was waste time going from one place to another. If he can't carry the cross, let's get somebody who can, and they just pull Simon into this service. He was from Cyrene in Africa. He had come to Jerusalem to worship God at the Passover. And at the moment that he was pulled from that crowd to carry the cross of Jesus, it, it must have been a bitter intrusion for Simon. Uh, he, he likely knew of Jesus. He likely understood what Jesus was being crucified for. But it's not very likely that he wanted to do this. As I mentioned in previous episodes, there's a list of uh, men in Acts chapter 13 uh, that, that were members of the church at Antioch. And the name Simon appears there. He is called Simon of Niger, a member of the Antioch church. And it's likely that this is the same Simon of Cyrene who was forced to carry the cross of Jesus. He's also said to be Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And the only reason that Mark would put that additional information in there is because the, the readers of his account would know who Alexander and Rufus were. And as it turns out in Mark chapter, or in Romans chapter 16, Rufus is mentioned, who was a close working associate and whose mother had been especially kind uh, to Paul. So it's interesting to see that. Simon may represent people who are forced into some kind of uh, allegiance with Christ. Uh, there are people who on the peripheral of the church are, are supportive of the church, even though not members of the church, who eventually, uh, when they give consideration to Jesus, the Christ, become members of the body of Christ. And uh, I'd like to believe that this Simon, eventually, after what he did, after what he witnessed, became part of the body of Christ. Talk more about the, the other faces around the cross when we come back in just a minute. Next, we're introduced to the Roman soldiers, the ones who erected his cross, verse 24. And they crucified him, and dividing up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what, what each man should take. Gathered around the foot of the cross then were these Roman soldiers who were in charge of his execution. And uh, uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that these soldiers were extremely familiar with uh, crucifixion and executions. This was, the, this was the job assigned to this particular group of men. Crucifixion was um, very, very common in Palestine in these days. Rome was, was trying very hard to send a stern message 
to the Jews and to all the people of Palestine about obedience to the Roman government. There were many insurrectionists uh, who were crucified during this time. There are hundreds and hundreds of records of crucifixion during the first century. So these fellas, the lowest of the low in the Roman Empire, could think of nothing better to do after they nailed him to the cross than to play their little game as they waited to while away the hours for him to, to die, for life to leave him finally. And they, at the foot of the cross, then begin to gamble for Jesus' only possession, his outer garment. I think these individuals are a classic example of the callous individuals who go through life having no interest in the cross whatsoever, showing complete indifference, who carelessly live their lives to, to gain whatever it is they want to gain, but who never really ever focus on the things that are important. And then there we also have the criminals who accompanied him to the cross. Verse 27 says, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 32 says, Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. These two men who were being crucified with Jesus were arrested in their campaign of terror and violence. They had been professed revolutionaries. They were insurrectionists. And they lived by the philosophy, get all that you can, whenever you can, no matter how you have to get it, and no matter who is hurt in the process. And they themselves, both of them up to this point, put Jesus in that same class regarded him as a criminal too, and they hurled their abuses at him because they felt that he could do nothing for them, and they thought then that they had the right to abuse him. Mark doesn't tell us what happened to one of those thieves, but the other gospel writers do, and we ought to take a look at that here in Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, we are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. This is one of those beautiful strands that, that is seen in this story of the crucifixion of Christ. Just before Jesus breathes his last, one of these men has a change of heart. Witnessing what's going on in the crucifixion, witnessing how Jesus, like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, witnessing his courage. He isn't striking out. He isn't hurling abuses back at his, his abusers. He's, even as he dies, leaving the impression with all who witness it that he is the Son of God. And before he dies, this criminal says, I want to be with you in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today, 
today you will be with, with me in paradise. We'll look at another one of the faces in the crowd when we come back in just a minute. The next face in the crowd is the group that are passing by, ridiculing the cross. Beginning in verse 29, those who were, uh, those passing by were hur hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. It, it, um, it's one of those disappointing aspects of human nature that um, people like to pick on people who are suffering. Uh, we, um, in our culture, do not have open executions anymore. We don't have witnesses of those things. I've done some reading about the the kind of executions that occurred in this country back in the 1800s when there would be public hangings and the, the crowd psychology that would exist there and the things that people would do to, uh, to those who were being executed, the things that they would say. Um, I remember when um, uh, one of the uh, Arab uh, leaders, Sodom, um, was executed. You remember seeing some of those pictures as they, as he went to the execution, they hurled abuses at him. Well, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that the religious leaders in, in this place, you can understand, you can understand, can't you? The, the thieves, the murderers, the insurrectionists hurling these abuses. But here you have the priests and and the men who represent God in that community saying such awful things about Jesus and to Jesus and uh, harassing him as he's dying. They stand and have their counterpart today in those who under the cloak of religion insult the most sacred facets of the Christian faith. There are other religious groups in the world today that make fun of Jesus and make fun of his death, make fun of his, his sonship. They are still on earth today, those who ridicule his cross. And then we have, and lastly this morning, we're running out of time, we have this nameless man, the one who observed the cross. He's interested in all of the proceedings here. His name isn't given to us. He's one of the bystanders there. But he, he enters the picture when, when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look at verse 35 and 36. When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran up and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. The people around the cross heard him crying out, Eloi, Eloi, and that sounded to them like Elijah. And at first glance, some have come to the conclusion that what, what uh, this man was doing was benevolent. He got a, a, a sponge and put some vinegar on it, and he raised it to the mouth of Jesus, and he's trying to help him quench the awful thirst that he must have been feeling, maybe offering him some kind of an anesthetic to, to help dull the pain. But if you look 
carefully at what's happening here, uh, this man's motive uh, becomes clear. He's wanting to help Jesus survive these difficult moments because he thinks that he's crying out for Elijah and he wants to help delay his death to see if Elijah will indeed come. This is, the, this is like the reality shows of our day, only much, much more gruesome. This guy wants entertainment and excitement. So let's put off the death as long as we can to see if Elijah comes. He's, he's moved not got by compassion, but by curiosity. Next week when we get together, we'll look at the additional faces around the cross. Hope you'll tune in for our study at that time. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.